Every so often on my Instagram page, I'll just do kind of like an ask me anything in my stories. And I decided, hey, why not make a video on YouTube just answering some questions that people have asked me. I put a call for questions out uh, yesterday in my stories and I'm just gonna answer some of my favorite questions that I was asked. Now there's a few that I've left off because I get asked them all the time and I actually did make another video on my page called Stop Asking Me These Questions where I just answer you know, the most asked questions that I get because I'll get new followers all the time and they'll kind of ask me stuff that I've already answered. So go check that video out for some of my most asked ones. But I did get some really good and some really unique questions that I'll answer today. So let's hop into it. So the first question has to do with storage and how do I not run out of space when I'm on the road? Well, the key is to always make sure you have enough space to store all of your video for the duration of that trip. I tend to rely on solid state drives. They're great to edit off of because they're super fast and they're also crazy fast when transferring footage to. So I'll use these when I'm at the racetrack and then every night when I get back to the hotel, I'll back everything up to one of these just regular everyday external hard drives. I'll usually bring either a two or a five terabyte depending on how much I'm gonna be shooting that weekend. I buy so many of these drives that I'm actually at the point where I'm buying these wholesale now, which is insane. Building on that storage question, somebody also asked, how am I backing everything up? Well, for the longest time, I was just using a fireproof safe with all kinds of hard drives in it. But that gets to be absolutely ridiculous. Hard drives do fail over time and you're spending so much money on hard drives. Also, everything's just on a different drive. So if you wanna pull from things and make a video, like my 2023 recap video took forever because I had to look through all these different hard drives to find the footage that I needed. But for 2024, I finally decided to build a network attack storage device. Now this is kind of just like a big hard drive made up of smaller hard drives. It'll have about 80 terabytes worth of space that I can store everything on. You plug it in via a network cable rather than a USB and it's super fast. You've got all of your footage in one spot and you just edit off of it. You can even plug this into your home network and you can access it when you're on the road, kind of like your own Dropbox. Now speaking of Dropbox, I know a lot of people will say, what, do you have a cloud storage as well? I do have Dropbox just for sharing files with clients. Um, um, unfortunately, if you want to store big video files on a cloud, you're going to be spending thousands and thousands of dollars a year because cloud space is just not as cheap as it used to be. If you're on one of those like legacy unlimited Google drives, never get rid of it because there's no such thing as an unlimited cloud anymore. They do get advertised as unlimited, but make sure you read the fine print because we bought the unlimited Dropbox. I shared it with some other friends. It was really expensive. And after about five or six months, they capped us and refused to add any more space. So unlimited is not always unlimited. My favorite monopod or tripod. This is a good one because I don't often use a monopod or a tripod anymore. I tend to be handheld shooting a lot. Now I'd hold it up for you, but it's obviously got the camera on it right now, but I use a Manfrotto fluid head uh, system. A fluid head is very important if you wanna get smooth panning or smooth tilting. They're obviously more expensive than a non-fluid head, but invest some money and get a proper tripod head if you want to have those smooth motions. And then for the sticks, I just use some carbon fiber sticks from Manfrotto. Auto. They were expensive, but it's because they're super lightweight compared to, you know, aluminum sticks. So when I'm, they're in my check bag, they save me a couple pounds and that is just super important to me. So it was worth the cost. I was on the fence about buying carbon fiber sticks for a long time because they were expensive, but then my decision was made for me when my original tripod got stolen at Le Mans this year. So I needed to buy some new ones anyway. And then with monopods, I only really use a monopod when I'm shooting at an oval track where you're not allowed to have tripods or at like a street circuit. But even then I tend to just shoot handheld. I was using an iFootage monopod and I'll leave a link for that in the description below as well. So we talked about tripods and monopods. Now let's talk about shooting handheld. And I do get this question a lot and of course got it again for this video is how do I keep my footage stable when I'm shooting handheld? And there's some different strategies for that. One thing is by adding some weight to your rig. If you just add some weight to your handheld rig, it's going to definitely help you keep it stable. And with weight comes balance. Right now my FX6, I've noticed my rig is a little unbalanced. It tends to hang more to one side in my hand and I have to compensate for that. So going into this year, I'm gonna figure out how I can sort of make it perfectly balanced so it's easier to hold in my hand. But the biggest way to get that stabilized footage handheld is to just practice being stable. I know that sounds crazy and everyone hates when like, 
the answer is just you need to practice more because everybody wants a hack. And I know someone's saying, well, what about gyro stabilization and post? If you wanna try with gyros, go for that. It's not something I'm really interested in doing. I wanna just get realistic shots in camera without having to do a bunch of post stabilization. But the one thing that I always like to preach is that it's okay to have some shake in your image. Not everything needs to be buttery smooth. This of course depends on the project that you're delivering and what you're going for. But for me, like when I'm shooting an up close action pit stop sequence, I want the viewer to feel like they're there, like they're part of the pit crew. And if everything is buttery smooth and perfect, it's not gonna feel that way. Like if you watch the beach scene from Saving Private Ryan, or you watch you know, the battle scene in Children of Men, you feel like you're there because the camera is moving around as you would move, just like you're looking you know, directly through your eyes. And I love how that looks on camera, and it just, again, adds so much realism. So yeah, don't be afraid of some shake. So next up is a question about manual versus autofocus. And I'm gonna be a little preachy here, but again, this is kind of a YouTuber thing and a YouTube videographer thing where everyone is obsessed with autofocus and talking about the next great autofocus. And autofocus is a great tool that can really help you do your job, whether you're tracking someone on a gimbal or using the eye focus tracking like I am to shoot this video. It is incredible how much autofocus has helped us do our jobs by having one less thing that we need to worry about. Rather than pulling focus, we can worry about what framing we're doing because we can trust that autofocus. But there's gonna be scenarios in which you can't use autofocus. For myself, I think I probably use 60-40 or even 70-30 in favor of autofocus. Uh, having autofocus to shoot trackside is a massive help because again, like I said, it's just one less thing I need to worry about. But being able to manually pull focus is an integral part of being a videographer and operating a camera. And I just see too many younger people that haven't practiced that skill. I was even working with another you know, great accomplished videographer who straight up told me that they never use manual focus, that they really struggle when they have to because they've relied on autofocus for so long. You might be in a scenario where your autofocus you know, breaks or isn't working properly, and you can't just go to your client at the end and give them a bunch of blurry footage and say, how oh, my autofocus broke. There's also all kinds of specialty shots you can only get while manual focusing, like shooting through you know, different types of fencing or doing a panning shot through the trees like I absolutely love. You have to manually focus those because you just cannot achieve them with autofocus. So again, while autofocus is an incredible achievement you know, in terms of camera technology and how much it's helped us, make sure you're always practicing your manual focus because it's an incredible skill to have. Sticking with camera equipment, uh, next up is, do you think it's important to have new camera equipment to be able to create videos? Now, I've always harped on this on TikTok and on different you know, social medias that it's not really about the gear. It's more about the individual. I can give you know, an absolute beginner a Ari Alexa and are they going to make an incredible video? Probably not. But if I give you know a very accomplished cinematographer a Canon T3i, they're probably gonna make me a pretty decent film at the end of the day. Obviously, like I said, with the autofocus, having a newer camera with newer features can definitely make your job a lot easier. It can make the image quality better. It can make low light shooting better. And these are all great tools to help us do our jobs better. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is your vision and what you want to create. Now, buying new camera equipment can get you more excited about filmmaking because you want to use your new camera or it's easier to use or has features that you like. It's the same as like getting a new guitar. Like you might not like the guitar you have, so you don't practice often. You get a new one that you really like, you want to practice more. Same is true with camera equipment. But at the end of the day, having that new camera with all this new bells and whistles, it's not going to immediately make you better at composition or better at storytelling, right? And those are what's really important when it comes to making a compelling video piece. This is a great question, and I'm gonna go with this 2019 MacBook Pro. And the reason for that is because this just unfortunately was a very poor attempt at a professional laptop by Apple. Uh, it overheated constantly. The fans would run even when you were just like watching Netflix on it. It got incredibly hot to the point where you couldn't even have it sit in your lap. It would pretty much burn you. And when I explained that to them at the Genius Bar, they just said to me, well, we don't call them laptops. I spent hours on the phone with Apple support and they told me, nope, it's acting how it should. And I'm like, this is impossible. Like I was at the point where I'd be in the media center and people would be turning around to look at me because they'd hear my fans running. They were running at 76 or 77 decibels. It was absolutely ridiculous. And this machine was a $5,000 custom build. It was a massive waste of money. Apple should have recalled them. It's 
really unfortunate that they decided to stick by this very poor product and I've since replaced it with another MacBook because yes, I'm stuck in the Apple ecosystem and as much as this was annoying, I did buy another MacBook. It's worked incredibly well, so I'm happy with it, but this is a $5,000 paperweight, unfortunately. So this is another really great question, which is what are three positives and three negatives about doing your job? Well, the positives are that I get to do what I love and I make a living. And then another positive is that I get to travel a lot, which is incredible. Until April of 2022, I had never been outside of Canada or the United States. And I've now been to like 15 or 16 countries just in you know less than two years. So that's really cool. And then third, I would say, are that I get to be around some amazing people and I've met some of my best friends doing this job. And then some negatives are that, you know, I'm a freelancer, so I have to do all of my own, you know, booking of travel, my own accounting, all of those kind of things. And those are all things that I don't really enjoy doing. The second negative is that this is not a guarantee. You know, at any point, manufacturers could pull their funding from racing and I could be out of a job, right? So it's much less secure than a regular nine to five job. And then the third thing is also travel. Now it's great to get to travel, but a lot of that travel is really crappy. Sitting in economy on long flights, doing layovers to try and save money, and you're away from your family a lot. So that's definitely the third negative. Okay, so this is like a great lifestyle question. Where and how do you eat around the track, sometimes far away from the media center? Right, so some tracks feed us and some don't. So a lot of the time at the European races, there's nothing. The media will get nothing. Sometimes the media center doesn't even have like a coffee machine. But sometimes we'll have bottled water or they'll have, you know, a water fountain you can fill up your water at. You can see some of my media center reviews that I've done uh, over on my TikTok page. Now at racetracks in Canada and the US, at least for bigger events like IMSA and IndyCar and NASCAR, they'll tend to feed the media at least one meal, if not two meals a day. Uh, sometimes they'll have some things out for breakfast and pastries. And if we have a later session, usually they'll provide us some sort of dinner. Now this can range from just like some pizzas to a fully catered menu. Does not matter to me, it's free, so I'm gonna eat it and it's provided and I'm very thankful. But when I'm out trackside, I'll usually have just like a cliff bar in my pocket or some trail mix, some sort of snacks, right? You know, peanut butter crackers, something like that. And always have water on me, especially if I'm in like Dubai or Malaysia where it's super hot and you need to stay hydrated. Okay, so another sort of like lifestyle question. This is a really good one. Have you ever been ejected from a racetrack or a paddock area? No, I have not. I've never gotten that into it with security. I'd say maybe only three or four times in my career have I like really got into it with security. I'm a fairly level-headed person and I'm pretty calm, but there are times when you just kind of lose it because security is incorrect and they're preventing you from doing your job, especially when things are really timely. There was a situation at Spa this year where I was trying to go trackside and I was stopped by a security guard and they said, you don't have the right kind of vest. Yours says TV, it needs to say track. And I said, no, 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 the ones that say track are only for people allowed to be trackside and not in the pits. The ones that say pit lane are track and pit lane and TV can go anywhere, but they weren't trained properly and didn't know. He would not let me go trackside and I missed the last 20 minutes of that session, which is a huge deal. So I got very upset. There's also been a few times where police officers have handled the podium at certain US races and I'll just let you imagine what that was like. Not great. I also had one scenario where a security guard did put their hands on me and I didn't react well to it. They had no reason to do so. They just wanted to see my credential as I had walked past them. And uh, yeah, I reacted as you would. There's no reason to touch me in that scenario. Use your words, you know. Sometimes you give people a security t-shirt and a walkie talkie and they think they own the world. And we do have to bear the brunt of that pretty often. Why is Spa not a classic for photo video? So I've talked about this a few times on social media. I don't think Spa is that great of a circuit to shoot. It seems to be every casual motorsport fan's favorite circuit because they just see Eau Rouge and how it's, you know, part of lore now in motorsport, really. And outside of that sequence of corners, it's not a great circuit to shoot. There is a couple cool spots where you can shoot through the trees and things along the Camel Strait and then along the backstretch before they come into the final chicane. But outside of that, it's a pretty okay circuit to film. It's just not that great. You have to work really hard there to get anything from outside of Eau Rouge Radion. So it's just not my favorite circuit to shoot and people can hate on me, but I'm gonna do a video at some point where I rank every circuit I've been to and it will not be in the top 10. 
What's the most challenging project you ever shot and how did you overcome it? Um, that's a good question. So I'm trying to think what the most challenging was. I'd say probably just the 24 hours of Lamar this year. And it was multiple projects, obviously for different clients, but it was just a lot of work and not a lot of time. There was so much leading up and late sessions and extra things and a bunch of things that happened like a credentials not scanning properly and just things that you don't plan for that are outside of your control that affect you. But it's all about how you react to those things and overcome them, you know, like, yeah, it's annoying, our credentials weren't working properly, so I just took the time and went and got that taken care of and didn't get furious about it because I try not to spend energy like getting upset about things because you know we need that time and that energy for more important things. So yeah, it was it was a tough event. I talked a little bit about it in my 2023 recap, but it it was a tough event, but you know, we got through it and we made some stuff that I'm really happy with. So when you hire help for a race, what do you look for? Now, that's a great question. So when I'm gonna hire help for a race, the first things I look for is really personality. What is a person like and what do I think they can handle? Are they gonna be able to handle working a 24 hour race? Are they going to be okay with late nights and early mornings? You know, or are they gonna complain? Are they gonna, you know, bitch and whine about it? Or, you know, is that just gonna be par for the course and they're cool with it? And the second is looking at their portfolio, right? What have they done in the past, you know? What's their editing like? How quickly can they get a project done? Because speed is very important in what we're doing, working for multiple clients and getting people daily things. People want an edit, you know, at the end of the day. Are they gonna be fast enough to get that done? Are they decisive? If someone is very indecisive or very concerned that something's not good enough, you know, that's gonna affect their speed in getting a project done. So they need to have confidence and decisiveness for me to really want to work with them. And the third thing is value for money. Are they gonna provide me what I expect for the amount of money they want me to pay them, right? It's the same thing when clients hire me. I need to provide good value for money or they're not gonna hire me. So I think I'm gonna end off on this question, which is, you know, just how do you get past, you know, a creative block? Now this happens to all of us, right? We're gonna have times where we just don't have any creativity left. By the end of 2023, I was completely dead. I'd worked too many events and I was really struggling to come up with any new ideas. And I was just harping on a lot of my old stuff. You know, I was just falling back on my like lazy older techniques that I'm used to doing and not trying anything new. And that's just cause I was tired and didn't have much energy left. Some of the strategies that I use though, to get past this is again, take time away. That's a big thing. Don't work too many races like I did. You know, I've made a promise to myself, I'm gonna do a little bit less and I'm gonna take some time between events to really just, you know, recharge and walk away and not look at cameras and just rest. Another thing I'll do during like long edits is I'll just get up and walk away for a few hours. You know, get up, go for a walk. Some of the best thinking you'll ever do is while you're out for a walk, you know, just get away from your computer, go for a stroll around the block and just try to recharge. The third thing I'll do is just try to find inspiration and, you know, get new ideas. And I do a lot of that by viewing, you know, films and content from outside of my niche. Don't just watch a lot of motorsport content, watch other things, watch, you know, dramas, watch comedies, things where the filmmaking techniques can really inspire you to try something new. You know, I can draw a lot of inspiration from, you know, just TV series and films that I watch. And that really helps me get past some of those creative blocks. Well, there you have it. Just some quick questions from my Instagram story. Thanks so much to everyone that sent questions in. I did block everyone's name out to keep everyone anonymous. So we don't know who asked which question, but again, thank you so much for sending those in. This is my first YouTube video of 2024. It's gonna be a big year. I'm hoping to post, you know, at least once every two weeks, if not a bit more often. So stay locked to my YouTube page here, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any uploads. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you folks more content from behind the scenes of my job as a motorsport videographer. Be sure to leave some comments down below and some ideas you have or things that you'd like to see, you know. Hey Mark, can you do a tour of the paddock here? Hey Mark, can you do a tour of the media center? You know, let me know, leave those comments below and I'll try and put that content together for you. Well, one more thing before I go, if you like this incredible Icon LD snapback hat or this cool like throwback retro lockdown shirt that's definitely not inspired by Momo, uh, yeah, if you wanna get one of those, you can go to lockdownbrand.com, use my code MARK10, you'll get 10% off and I will get a very small commission. It's win-win. I'll leave links and all that down in the description below. But again, there's also links to you know, all my equipment that I use down in the description below. So you can check out any of that. Any equipment I talked about in this video is also linked below. 
my socials link below. There's all kinds of links below. But again, thanks so much for sending in those questions and for subscribing to my YouTube channel here and following my journey. I really appreciate each and every one of you and we'll see you in the next one.